Hello, and wherever you are in the world, welcome to this webinar. We're pleased that you're joining us for today's session. And before we hand over to our panelists, we'll run through a few housekeeping details. Firstly, there's a member of IOSH team operating behind the scenes to ensure the smooth running of this webinar. They are available to help you should you need it, and you can message them using the chat function, which is at the bottom of your screen. You will also see a Q&A option. If you have any questions relating to the content, please post these here. A Q&A will be carried out towards the end of the session and we'll get through as many questions as we can. At the end of the presentation, a feedback poll will appear on your screen. Please take a moment to complete this as we value your feedback and this helps us to improve our service to you and shape future guidance. Any value you gain from this session can be used as part of your CPD portfolio. We do not issue formal certificates of attendance for our webinars, but you will receive an email confirming your attendance, details of which can be used to record your CPD. Information on CPD can be found on our website. Where we have been given a speaker's consent, these webinars are recorded and will be made available on our website. You'll also be able to find a list of all our other recordings, as well as details of any upcoming webinars. Finally, details of all of this information will also be posted in the chat box shortly. We would now like to hand over to our panellists and hope that you, as listeners, enjoy the session. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome uh, to the I Zoom call on five top tips for water safety. Uh, before I go through any of the housekeeping rules, just a couple of names to introduce you today. Firstly, myself, my name is James and I am the chair of IOSH Southwest. And we have, have with us uh, Daniel Pitcher from the Water Hygiene Centre who will be presenting today. Um, so before I hand over to Daniel, uh, just a few small housekeeping rules. Uh, the webinar will last around 35 to 40 minutes. There will be approximately 10 minutes at the end uh, for questions and answers. Uh, we will endeavour to answer as many questions as we can, provided they're not rhetorical. Um, but please be aware we don't always have time to get through all the questions. Uh, a copies of the slides for Daniel's presentation this afternoon will be copied to the IOSH microsites. Uh, this Zoom call will be recorded and posted on the IOSH uh, YouTube site and is live on uh, YouTube as we speak. Um, and as the introduction said, there will be a small uh, survey at the end of the uh, presentation, so please do fill that in, that is quite important to us. So I would now like to introduce you to Daniel, who will take it away. Uh, uh, Daniel from the Water Hygiene Centre, it is over to you. Thanks James, okay, wish me luck. I'm going to try and share my screen now. That's working fine, Daniel. Excellent, thanks, James. Okay, everyone, hi. Um, thanks for uh, coming along and uh, joining today. It's fair to say, um, before I get started, that over the last 12 months, we've all had to learn and to talk and meet people in different ways through Zoom and Teams. And uh, we've all learned uh, the new language of speaking mute. Um, I'm pleased to report that uh, my partner and the dogs are downstairs behind three closed doors, so hopefully there won't be any interruptions and I haven't got a cat filter across my face, so uh, yeah, I can see myself. Um, it's fair to say that these experiences are very much like a silent disco. For those of you that have partaken in a silent disco, you know what I mean. You're in your own little world and now it's with the added advantage of being blindfolded because I can't hear or see any of you. Needless to say, um, I'm going to be talking to a group of people um, where I've got no interaction or no feedback, no response. So hopefully I won't make too many mistakes. Um, OK, onwards. So five top tips for water safety, a very broad topic. And there is some method in my madness for picking five top tips, which I'll run through towards the end. The focus on water safety um, will cover all types of organisations. 
And through the presentation, I'll make reference to various HSE guidance, healthcare guidance and British standards. At the very end of the slides, there is a slide with links on where you can find details of those um, publications. OK, so my first question really is, why do we need top tips for water safety? There are various guidance documents that have been around for years, and I mean years. And do we really need five top tips for water safety? I mean, when was the last time anyone heard of Legionnaire's disease in the news? I mean, it's not as interesting as Brexit or US presidents or even coronavirus. So let me just bring home a few facts on Legionnaire's disease and water safety. So over the last 12 to 18 months, yes, we've been absorbed by coronavirus and US presidential and Brexit. But some of the things that may have slipped by um, in Bournemouth, July 2019, a private spa where 14 patrons contracted Legionnaire's disease or the lesser illness, Pontiac fever. 39 people were reported to have symptoms, but these were not confirmed by the lab. The spa has since closed. Still, we have cases being reported in the West Midlands, September 2020. Eight cases reported. Three were confirmed with lab testing. The HSE were investigating this outbreak and Public Health England stated at the time there was no direct link, although evidence was possibly pointing towards a common source. So moving on from what might be in the news to something a little bit more serious, and this is prosecutions. And an NHS trust in 2011 had one death from Legionnaire's disease. And the HSE investigation found that between October 10 and November 11, there were 114 positive Legionella sample results and 651 non-compliant temperatures. And there was no adequate evidence of action being taken to resolve these positive samples or non-compliant temperatures. Another prosecution, this time relating to a council-operated care home, where there was a death in 2012, and the investigation found that at the property there was a history of Legionella pro uh, there was a history of Legionella problems. The monitoring, checking, and flushing tasks given to were all given to the home's handyman, who was inadequately trained and supervised. Evidence of inadequate temperature checks being done, and for some of those checks being done on thermostatic mixing valves, they were being done incorrectly. Showers were not being descaled or disinfected quarterly as required, and the flushing of little used outlet was reliant on the home's handyman, and there was no procedure in place for this to be done in the uh, handyman's absence. Quite a big prosecution here, a private company, in October 2013, it was a reported case of Legionnaire's disease for, uh, uh, with an employee of G4S Cash Solutions. This case, reported case, was never confirmed. The local environmental health officers went along and did an investigation. And what they found within the company was an unsigned health and safety policy from 2009 detailing the need for risk assessments. The, those risk assessments were only completed in 2012. The company who completed those risk assessments were not under contract. The risk assessment had identified 17 high-risk issues and they had failed to resolve them. There were dead legs identified within the systems that hadn't been resolved. The location of TMVs were unknown. Thermostatic mixing valves were unknown around the building. The domestic hot water storage was oversized and sampling points were unchecked. Prosecuted for failing to main water, maintain water systems in compliance with the health and safety at work regulation, uh, the health and safety at work regulations, management health and safety at work regulations, COSH L8, and the company were fined 1.8 million pounds. And our final example of a prosecution another NHS trust, a death from Legionnaire's disease in 2015. And what the HSE found, the building where the patient was located was an annex 
to a main ward, and this annex had been constructed in 2009. The water system in this annex was a separate loop of water into that annex, and there were no temperature checks and no tests for Legionella being carried out on that loop of water in that annex. The annex was known to have issues with the water system and Legionella bacteria was found. But interestingly, the strain of Legionella found within the water system was not the same Legionella that resulted in the patient's death. But the HSE concluded there was, signif there was significant and sufficient evidence to prosecute the trust for exposing patients to the risk from Legionella bacteria in its water systems. They are, suppose, they are if you like, the hard-hitting reasons for why there are the need for these five top tips. So let's move away from some of the hard-hitting and something that's a bit more evident with Legionella. And Public Health England actually issue a monthly Legionella report, albeit through 2020, they only issued two reports because Public Health England were very busy dealing with COVID-19. But having said that, um, focusing on their um, reports through 2019, thinking of the fact that we've I've just detailed um, cases of Legionnaires in 2019 and 20. The total number of confirmed cases of Legionnaires disease reported by Public Health England were 503. 503 cases of Legionnaires disease that very few actually got into the media and we heard about. The graph shows for 2019, the red bars compared with the three-year average, the green bars. And you can see that for January, April, May, June, July, August, October, November, these months in 2019 had more cases reported than the previous three years. You can see that the data follows the same pattern where you have a peak through June, July, August, September, October. This is what we call seasonal variation. And why does seasonal variation occur with reported cases of Legionnaires disease? Well, invariably, people go on holiday and we go overseas and go somewhere warm and stop in hotels or villas or apartments. Thinking of staying at home, when we do have a warm summer, our own buildings warm up. And if we think about where cold water tanks are traditionally located, they're located in the roof spaces of buildings. So these will warm up. And when our buildings warm up, invariably people reach out for portable chiller units. These are all possible causes on why we might see more cases of Legionnaires disease being reported in summer months. That monthly report from public, uh, that monthly report from Public Health England then identifies those sources of cases. And they put them into four categories. So community, nosocomial, travel abroad, and travel within the UK. And what do these groups mean? Well, community acquired. So individuals who've contracted Legionnaires disease from their local community, local community where they live. So, for example, the largest outbreak of Legionnaires disease was Barrow and Finesse in 2002 due to cooling, uh, cooling Town not being maintained properly, 190 cases of Legionnaires disease. And a similar outbreak in Edinburgh in 2012, individuals in the vicinity of those cooling towers contracted Legionnaires disease. You then have nosocomial or from the hospital environment. So patients go into hospital and whilst they're in hospital, they contract Legionnaires disease. And you can see from the graph that these numbers are quite low. When you think that hospitals contain those individuals who are most susceptible to Legionnaires disease, i.e. they're desperately unwell or elderly, the numbers are low. Why do we think the numbers are low? Well, in healthcare, there is very specific guidance, HTMO 401, which I'll come on to later. That's been around for a long time and has been followed quite strictly by healthcare organisations. You have travel abroad, so going somewhere sunny and warm. Um, I'm sure as soon as we are allowed to uh, safely travel, some of us might want to get away somewhere warm and uh, relax for a little while. So just a thought, if you do get away somewhere warm, maybe south of Spain, when was the last time the water in that hotel was actually used? What were the hotel doing with their water systems 
whilst the hotel has been unoccupied for all of these months, and then you are a guest in that hotel, how have they managed that water system to make sure stagnation and potential waterborne pathogen proliferation has been dealt with before they allow um, guests to move back in? And then travel around the UK, so visiting different parts of the UK. So, for example, myself, being a consultant for water safety, I look after clients through Scotland, Wales, the South Coast and the Channel Islands. Home for me here is in Oxfordshire. And when I go away and visit clients, invariably I'm stopping in hotels. So if I were to be unfortunate enough to contract Legionnaire's disease from a different part of the UK and then come home and be diagnosed, that would be typed back, hopefully, to where it is that I've just been. So that would be a travel a uh, uh, UK travel uh, related in a uh, case of Legionnaire's disease. But it's not all about Legionella. There are other waterborne pathogens. And for those of you that are watching and listening and are from a healthcare sector, you'll be up to speed with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. But for those of you that aren't from a healthcare sector, Pseudomonas and Pseudomonas aeruginosa has been around for a very long time, but it hit the headlines in 2012 with the death of four babies, um, three in Belfast and one in Londonderry, where the babies had contracted Pseudomonas aeruginosa from the taps on the hospital wards that they were in. This resulted in technical guidance being issued in March 2012 to help protect those susceptible patients to Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And in March 2013, updated technical guidance was issued in the form of an addendum to the HTMO4. And this, this addendum introduces the concept of a water safety group and water safety plan. In May 2016, the HTMO4 was updated and the addendum had now uh, was then replaced with HTMO4 Part C. So just a little bit of background on Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Again, Public Health England uh, collates data on cases of uh, sorry on cases of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and this data comes from Pseudomonas aeruginosa bacterium infections from NHS trusts and uh, clin clinical clinical commissioning groups. Uh, the data that I'm about to show you comes from uh, April 17 to March 22, and it was collated and downloaded from the 23rd of June and published, uh, 23rd of June 2020 and published on the 3rd of December 2020. And it represents data from 146 acute trusts and 191 CCGs. So we can see 2017-18, 4,305 cases of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. 2018-19, 4,186, and in 2019-20, 4,336. So pretty consistent with high numbers of cases of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Again, we don't hear about that in the news. Some of the threads that come through with this, um, it's typically elderly males over 75 who are most prevalent to infection with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and most cases have previously been reported in the southeast, and this is most likely due to population density. So I started with the question asking, why do we need these top five top tips for water safety? I think the evidence that I've just presented is justification for the five top tips. So here we go, let's get started. Our first top, my first top tip, the appointment of individuals. Well, why do we need individuals to be appointed? The approved code of practice, L8, on Legionnaire's disease, the control of Legion bacteria, Legionella bacteria in water systems, outlines the requirement for duty holders to appoint a competent, responsible person. And that responsible person should have sufficient authority, knowledge, and competence in order to deliver the role. L8 also outlines others who may be involved as well. And it states those, spe but those specific specifically appointed to implement control measures and strategies should also be suitably informed, instructed, and trained, and their suitability assessed. So at this point, um, 
everything those of us that might take uh, buses or get in a taxi, those individuals, those drivers, they actually have had to have passed a driving test to deliver that role. The same is true here for our responsible person and those others involved. They need to have been suitably trained in order to deliver that role. Who else might be involved? Who are some of these other people? Well, I'm mindful that within the audience today, there could be small organizations, restaurant owners, there could be um, individuals from schools, there could be individuals from large factories, hotel chains, universities, local authorities. So those people who are involved in water safety will vary depending on the size of your organization. It's fair to say the larger the organization, more people will be involved. And that could include building managers, team leaders, plumbers, contractors, plumbers, contractors, installers, maybe domestics, caretakers, designers. And if we're thinking healthcare, then within NHS trusts and boards, you are more likely to have infection prevention control, microbiologists and infection control doctors. Whoever is involved in water safety and can impact on water safety has a collective responsibility and they come together as a water safety group. The water safety group are those persons who are impacting on water safety with their decisions and actions. We can see on the screen at the moment that a water safety group, and, and, and this model has been taken from HTMO4, and this model identifies various groups who could be involved in water safety. So within the group itself, you've got estates management, facilities management, infection control, microbiologist, with input from auditors, authorizing engineers, risk assessors, contractors, plumbers, operatives, domestics, and specialist departments. And you can see all of these individuals feeding into the water safety group or being part of the water safety group and the water safety group feeding up to the management, the board, the CEO, and the duty holder. And we saw just a moment ago that the duty holder has a responsibility to ensure that there is a point there in a, there is an appointed responsible person. So HSG 274 Part 2, Appendix 2.2 in the written scheme, clearly details the need for accountability up to the duty holder or the chief executive. So a communications pathway. So thinking within your organizations. Have you identified all those people involved in water safety? Have you identified that you've got a water safety group and a communications pathway for all of those involved? If you're not sure, then it's really time to start thinking about all of those involved, where they sit, are they coming together as a water safety group and establishing this communications pathway? My second top tip is risk assessment. What is it that we're risk assessing? Well, I detailed at the start with the prosecution for that large company. That prosecution was for failing to maintain water systems in compliance with the Health and Safety at Work, etc. Act, Management of Health and Safety at Work Regulations, Control of Substances, Hazardous Health Regulations, and L8. They were fined £1.8 million. Under the Management of Health and Safety at Work regulations and Control of Substances Hazardous Health regulations, you are required to have a written risk assessment where you've got more than five employees that has to be a written risk assessment. If we think about COSH, Control of Substances Hazardous to Health, COSH is not just about bottles of bleach and material safety data sheets, but COSH, the principles are you risk assess and where you find a substance or an instance that is hazardous to health, you eliminate that substance that's hazardous to health. The question is, can you eliminate water and waterborne pathogens? I don't think you can. The next element of COSH is, well, can you substitute this thing that's hazardous for something less hazardous? Well, can you substitute water for something that's less hazardous? No, you can't. So then the final element of COSH is looking at the management of that risk. So you need to have done your risk assessment to identify what the risk is. Then you can start to manage the risk of your waterborne pathogens. So we do need to have risk assessments in place. 
Thinking of the approved code of practice, L8, it is a requirement of L8 to have a risk assessment. And it states, you need to risk assess where there is a reasonably foreseeable risk of exposure to Legionella bacteria. And that can be in the form of cooling systems, so where you might have cooling towers or, or, or evaporative condensers, hot and cold water systems, spa pools, or other plant and systems that contain water that can create and increase the risk of Legionella during its operation or being maintained. Time for a mini audit. Thinking about your properties and the water systems that you might have within your properties, do you have risk assessments covering all these types of risk systems? As an example, I've recently audited an organisation and as part of that audit, I was reviewing risk assessment reports. And for a risk assessment report for a leisure centre, I identified that the leisure centre had a swimming pool, but the risk assessment report did not include an entry for that swimming pool. So that large hole in the floor with thousands of litres of water wasn't included in the risk assessment. One must question the competency of the risk assessor and the suitability of that risk assessment for not including the pool. Thinking of this risk assessment, L8 requires that risk assessment and it goes on to state that duty holders must ensure those persons who carry out the risk assessment must be competent to do so. So thinking of your risk assessments, have you completed that risk assessment? Are you competent to have completed that risk assessment? If you are looking to contract out your risk assessment, who do you go to? Well, the approved code of practice recommends that when you are reaching out to external organisations, you look to the Legionella Control Association for support. Within the Legionella Control Association, there are 300 plus members who are registered to deliver many services, including risk assessments. The question is, which one do you pick? Well, you can filter down a little bit further. What do I mean? Well, there are other standards that we can look for when it comes to risk assessments. So for those of us that are perhaps used to managing the risk of Legionella, we're perhaps used to the concept of sending water samples to a UCAS laboratory for analysis and or sending thermometers to a UCAS lab for calibration. You can actually get UCAS accredited companies to deliver risk assessments to a standard. There are currently 13 companies registered to deliver UCAS accredited risk assessments and the Water Hygiene Centre is one of them. So thinking of risk assessments, look to the competent, you need to look at the competency of your risk assessor. So you might want to reach out to Legionella Control Association and then maybe filter down further for a UCAS accredited risk assessment. So just thinking of this UCAS accredited risk assessment, what standard is it to? Well, there is the British standard BS8580. This was initially launched in 2010. It was updated in 2019. And it is the standard for a risk assessment for Legionella control. The approved code of practice and HSG274 don't tell you how to complete the risk assessment. But the British Standard BS8580 outlines how to complete the risk assessment and factors that need to be considered, including the competency of the risk assessor, the independence of that risk assessor, so they have no vested interest with ongoing remedial works, monitoring or repair to faults that they might find within the risk assessment. There is the need for that desktop appraisal of management records, written schemes, the previous risk assessments, and the status of remedial works and monitoring records. Gone are the days where it's just turn up and look at the water systems, looking at a true risk of how water is being managed and how Legionella, the risk of Legionella is being managed, needs to consider this appraisal of management, written schemes, and previous risk assessments. Then there is the site survey, so the visual inspection of the water systems within those buildings, completing monitoring and possibly Legionella testing as part of the Legionella risk assessment. The need for the evaluation of risk of that 
building and the water systems and a defined risk rating associated with that water system. And finally, reporting of those identified risks and what are the controls and the need for reassessment. So reassessment, gosh, okay. Well, a risk assessment isn't something that you complete and forget about or put on the shelf. Um, risk assessments do need to be reviewed and reassessed. In the previous version of L8, there used to be a two-year frequency for risk assessment review. This two-year frequency was actually removed when HSG 274 Part 2 was issued in November 13, and again, updated and reissued in early 2014. How many still actually rely on that two-year frequency for rolling out a risk assessment? And actually, how many organisations have a formal risk assessment review matrix based on those review criteria detailed on the screen at the moment? So, water safety. It's not just about Legionella. There are other risks to consider. An example being, if we are using temperature control to manage the risk of Legionella growth, so we keep our hot water at 60 degrees C, we now have a scold risk. So how many have actually completed that scold risk assessment? What is it that we need to consider? We need to consider, firstly, who are the most susceptible to scold risk? The elderly, the very young, those with disabilities, those with sensory loss. And where we have identified those who are most susceptible, what are the types of outlets that are accessible to them? Total body immersion outlets, for example, baths and showers, would be a consideration where you've got the most volume of uh, or surface area of skin where those individuals could potentially be scolded. HTMO4, and I know HMO4 is healthcare. For those of you that are not healthcare and listening, I, I do strongly urge you to take note of HMO4 because it does actually provide a really useful additional resource on managing water safety in Legionella over and above the approved code of practice. But HMO4 also provides a useful summary on risk assessment. And it outlines the need that the risk assessments will help inform the water safety plan through the identification of the potential hazards, so such as Legionella, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, other pathogens, chemicals, and scold risk. It goes on to say that these risk assessments and those hazards that have been identified and those risk systems need to inform the water safety plan, and those risk assessments do need to be completed by competent persons, and those competent persons must be able to demonstrate their experience and competency to the water safety group. Moving on to my third top tip, written schemes of control and water safety plans. Why do we need these schemes of control? If we have a risk assessment that's identified the risk systems that you have, great. Now you know what you've got. You need to have a written plan of control for managing, maintaining, fixing, and monitoring these risk systems. This identification of risk systems and associated assets or risk, risk systems within your buildings are essentially an ingredients list. The water safety plans are, if you like, the recipe or the instructions on what you need to do with those risk systems and associated assets. HSG 274 Part 2, Appendix 2.2, outlines the need for a written scheme of control, and that is, what do you do with what you found in your risk assessment? And it says, well, you need to define the correct and safe operation of those risk systems that you've identified. You need to define what are the precautions to prevent and minimize the risks associated with those systems. What are the tests, microbiological monitoring, other operational checks, inspections, calibrations to be carried out, and frequencies and corrective actions for those risk systems. What are the remedial actions to be taken by an organization when the control scheme is shown not to be effective? What other health and safety information might be needed? 
So, for example, if there is the use of chemicals for controlling water systems, so storage, handling, use and disposal of those chemicals. And incident plans. So what do you do if there is a loss of hot water? What do you do when there's been a loss of mains cold water? Or how do you manage repeat high positives of Legionella within water systems or even an outbreak of Legionellosis? So your risk assessment has identified what you've got. Your risk assessment is not the written scheme, but now you know what your risk assessment has identified, you need to draft that written scheme. Written schemes are not generic documents that you can just purchase. Another example being, having audited a client's written scheme for a very small property, a football pavilion, where there are showers for um, individuals to use after playing football or, or exercising, uh, the written scheme of control detailed how to manage a cooling tower. There was no cooling tower for that pavilion. That was not an applicable written scheme for that pavilion. A water safety plan. So we'll just take a little step further and HTMO4 outlines water safety plans. Well, what is this water safety plan? It's more of a holistic approach to managing water safety within your organization. From your risk assessment, you've identified the hazards and you now de need to detail what controls there are. The water safety group are the owners of that water safety plan and they need to keep it keep it under continual review. It is a living document. So it's covering all water risks all the time. There is a British standard for water safety plans. This British standard was issued on the 30th of May last year, and that's British standard BS 8680. So for the first time, there is now a true definition on what a water safety plan is. And the British standard defines the water safety plan being a strategic plan that details the arrangements for the safe use and management of all water systems and the associated systems and equipment on that water system. Who is to use and input on the development of that water safety plan? Well, I've just said it's the members of the water safety group. So they could be the designers, the, des uh, the designers, installers, those responsible for commissioning, decommissioning, those responsible for maintenance operation, risk assessors, those responsible for ongoing control measures, monitoring, alterations and refurbishments, and ultimately the deconstruction of that property at the end of its life. Now, it's fair to say that the water safety plan is not going to be one document. And straight away, I'd like to point out that the water safety plan will be very reflective of your organisation. So for those individuals who've been managing water safety or Legionella for many years, you're going to have great elements of water safety plans in existence already. The British Standard 8680 does outline a suggested list of documents that may feature within the water safety plan. This includes governance arrangements, the need for risk assessment, control measures, validation and auditing, and supporting programmes. The British Standard does also include a gap analysis uh, tool within the appendix. So for those of you that are thinking about looking at water safety plans in a bit more detail, look at completing the gap analysis to help identify what would be most applicable for your organisations and what you've already got in place already. My fourth top tip, implementation management and monitoring. Why? Well, if we've made the effort to identify who's involved, go and do risk assessments and have a written scheme of control, now it's the time to implement the written scheme of control through the water safety group and have monitoring data to prove that we are in control. Our scheme of control and water safety plan is working. So the British Standard 8680 does outline what a water safety group is. And this water safety group is this multidisciplinary group, 
multidisciplinary group of individuals that are going to commission, develop and implement and manage this water safety plan. Ensure that water is safe at the point of use for all uses and users. It's going to advise on remedial actions and the required systems and outlets and actions that um, need to uh, take place if they are contaminated. Some of you may already have water safety groups in place. You might refer to it as a water management team. But let's just think about this water safety group. It needs to be defined. But where can we take information on what this water safety group is about? Well, this is where we look to HTMO4. And HTMO4 does outline a remit for water safety. And as I said, for some of you, you may not be healthcare. So when you look through this remit, some of you might think, well, that's not quite applicable. So the first uh, item being there on, on, on that list is to work, and work with and support the IPC team. For those of you from a non-healthcare basis, well, that, that doesn't cover, that doesn't apply. But we can look through some of the main flavors here on the remit of a water, uh, sorry, the, the remit of a water safety group. And then from that, developing your own terms of reference for your water safety groups. So just looking at some of the main flavors here, taking effective ownership. So those roles and responsibilities for all involved in water safety, have these been defined? Have these then been appointed? Looking at risk assessments, ensuring that risk assessments have been completed and remain updated as needed. Remember, Legionella is not the only water risk. Those risk assessment action plans that have fallen out of that risk assessment, they are kept under review and evidence that the Water Safety Group that those recommended actions have been completed within the agreed timeframes. Reviewing monitoring data. So, how many water safety groups actually have evidence on water system performance being presented at the water safety group? When I sit at a client's water safety group, as a member of that water safety group, I want to leave feeling assured, knowing that their water systems are being operated correctly. Very careful thought needs to go into how system performance reporting for assurance can be delivered. For some organizations, you might be using electronic data capture systems. These electronic data capture systems will help through perhaps dashboards or head up reports on water system performance. And the final flavor that I just want to highlight here is training. So how many water safety groups ha actually have a training needs analysis that is being reviewed at water safety groups to ensure all those involved in the management of water safety is known and confirmed and remains current. For example, people do move around within organizations. So people who leave and their replacements, they get included on that training needs analysis and they are provided with training that's applicable to their role. So the terms of reference you need to define for your water safety groups and then you need to deliver on those terms of reference. So the agenda for your water safety groups do need to be explicitly around your terms of reference. Just thinking of the, the terms of reference and those flavors that I've just pulled through on the previous slide, looking at this example of an agenda, those flavors are here. Review of appointments and training and competency, review of risk assessments, review of action plans, and review of compliance data, so operational monitoring data. And finally, my final top tip, record keeping. Well, why do we need records? Quite simply put, in health and safety law, we are guilty until we prove our innocence. We need records for everything that we do. And I don't mean vinyl. I know vinyl makes a bit of a comeback, but I don't mean vinyl. And I don't mean records scattered around on our desks. Thinking about my four previous top tips, so identification of responsible people. They need to be appointed in writing. Those risk assessments I detailed where you've got five or more uh, five or more employees, they need to be written risk assessments. On the back of those written risk assessments, you need a written scheme of control and water safety plan that defines what you've got and how you're going to manage it. And evidence, my fourth top tip being evidence of management and implementation. 
So just pulling through those flavours from the last few slides, examples of that terms of reference, agenda, action plans, training needs, written reports on system performance and evidence of corrective actions. Without evidence, without a documented record, it is difficult to prove something has actually been completed. And thinking of records, I strongly recommend that all organisations have a clearly defined document map, a defined structure for water safety documents, regardless of format, be it hard copy or soft copy, but that document map demonstrates to all who might be auditing you or outside inspectors that a defined document map demonstrates control and order on how you manage your documents. So in summary, my five top tips are listed here. So sorry, they're not in order, but here we go. I'll just run through them right quick. So we've got the need to identify risk, prepare a written risk assessment, implement, manage, monitor, keep records, and actually have uh, um, appointed individuals. So they, they, they were my five top tips, weren't they? So how many of you would like a copy of these to take away? I'm sure you all would. Well, quite simply, these five top tips can be found in your copies of the approved code of practice, paragraph two on page five. These five top tips, if any of you have been answering yes or no to these questions or these five top tips as I've run through them, excellent job. You've uh, effectively been completing a small management audit. If any of you were answering no or not sure to any of those five top tips, then you might want to explore this further. So think about an independent audit to see really where you are with your organisation on water safety. Just to recap, through the presentation, I've made reference to various organisations and their documents. Details can be found on this slide here, and the slides um, will be available for download, as James was detailing earlier at the start of the presentation. And just to conclude, I'd say thank you for listening. Um, no cat filters have popped up, no dogs have burst in. I think um, I've survived. I haven't made too many mistakes. But just to say, um, the Water Hygiene Centre, we do issue weekly blogs through our website and through LinkedIn. If you are on LinkedIn, you can either follow me or follow Water Hygiene Centre to receive these blogs. Or you can actually go onto our website and request to be added to our blog mailing list. Recent blogs that we've posted include Water Safety Groups Explained, What is an Authorising Engineer? risk review matrices tools. We also have a YouTube channel. You simply go to YouTube, search Water Hygiene Centre, and you'll find our channel. And on there, we've got various little videos lasting a few minutes on practical, helpful things, such as how to take temperatures or flushing little used outlets or sampling for Legionella. Thank you very much for listening. James, back to you, sir. Thank you, Daniel. That was a great uh, listening. Uh, if you have any questions, now is an opportunity for you to write those questions in the Q&A box. We have about 10 minutes remaining to answer any questions. Some of you have already started typing questions. So, Daniel, if you like, I'll go through the questions on it. Okay. Um, so, uh, let's start with some nice and easy ones. Uh, the WSP, the Water Safety Plan, and the Written Scheme of Control, are they the same thing or should an organization have both um, WSP and SC? So truly um, it would depend on the organization. Um, my desire would be that um, all organizations need to have a water safety plan. And within that water safety plan, there are going to be elements of that written scheme of control. So the written scheme of control is, um, who's involved, what precautions you take, what happens when things go wrong. And the water safety plan looks at governance, what you've got from your risk assessment and um, what you do to monitor what you do when things go wrong. So broadly, they are the same, yes. My view would be if we've got a water safety plan, the written scheme of control would actually be part of that uh, water safety plan. Okay, fantastic, thank you, Daniel. Okay, another question from Andrew here. Um, he understands that the 
um, legionella risk assessments should be regularly reviewed uh, as required by L8 and that general industry guidance suggests a biannual review. Um, he's saying, assuming that there are no significant changes, could you suggest any formal literature that backs up a two-year review recommendation? Um, so, the best guidance that I can offer for um, when risk assessment should be reviewed is what was um, detailed in HSG 274 on, on my slide. So, the two-year frequency has gone. And the criteria that the HSC have suggested for risk assessment review were listed. So it would be the fact that um, you are looking at those criteria and when change has occurred to go and do that risk assessment. Um, the, one of the things I suppose to take away is risk assessments now need to be more dynamic. So it's not just every two years go out and risk assess all of the properties again, but it needs to be more dynamic and more on a piecemeal basis. So has there been a change to the water system? Has there been a change to the use of the building? And that is the time to go and look at that risk assessment and review it. Perfect, thank you. Okay, um, another one here from Jenny saying, the new British standard BS8680 um, water safety plans, does it challenge your thoughts on the management of the water systems and do you think your Legionella risk assessments will look different because of the new British standard? So um, I think the new British standard for water safety plans will actually help tighten up and shape and guide all organisations on managing water safety more robustly. The fact that the British standard 8680 actually recommends and acknowledges the British Standard 8580 for Legionella Risk Assessment. Uh, it's looking to raise the standard for risk assessments and ensuring that water safety groups are in existence for organisations and that they are embracing all that is involved in water safety. It really, it is a really good um, and I'm not here trying to sell uh, the British standards, but they are really useful guides on trying to understand what a standard for a risk assessment is and for that water safety plan. The, the, the suggested guide on what might be in a water safety plan is going to vary greatly with um, organisations. So the British Standard 8680 does actually say, you know, for small organisations such as a hair salon, the water safety plan may be no more than a couple of pages. For a larger organisation, it's going to be far more embracing. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, another question here from Daryl saying, uh, what should a responsible person do, in a, for example, in a school, if they're the first person in and after the holidays? in order to protect themselves when they are flushing outlets? Do they need to protect themselves? Oh, yeah. <laughs> most definitely uh, protection of yourself and individuals is a key thing here. Um, so if we think about um, the operation of buildings through summer holidays, um, traditionally, um, it is the fact that perhaps water systems have been left stagnant over the six, eight week period. And um, the week before or two weeks before individuals come in and start flushing those outlets, um, fine, they need to be flushing them safely. So what might that be? The need for um, respirators or masks um, because the transmission of Legionella is through the droplets of water. Um, but actually, when we think about how water systems should be managed in a period of closure, um, there is another British standard, uh, sorry, there is a published document from British Standards, BS 855468, that talks about the management of water systems through a period of closure and certainly what with lockdown um, over the last year that document has uh, been very helpful and it's basically saying where you've got buildings that are going to be closed for less than 60 days to turn the hot water off and to flush those outlets routinely through that period of closure now if you're not going to be able to flush those outlets through that period of closure then look to flush and disinfect that water system before occupation so if um 
if schools are not flushing water systems through the holidays, and again, it depends on the size of the water system. If it's just a mains fed water system with point of use water heaters, the volume of water is going to be significantly less. But if you've got large cold water tanks and hot water generators, and that hasn't been flushed, the volume of water and the stagnation is going to be far more significant. And in those situations, it would actually be that following that published document, the need to um, do a disinfection of those water systems if they haven't been flushed through that holiday period. Okay, fantastic. Uh, another question. In a standard office, uh, um, if you're doing your monthly temperature checks, uh, you're running the taps, putting your sentinel points, do you still require to do a Legionella test annually or because you're managing it on a monthly basis, is there a requirement where you can get away with not testing because you know you're managing the temperatures? That is an excellent question because the only requirement to do Legionella testing, which is defined in the approved code of practice and um, HSG 274 is where you have routine testing is only required where you have high susceptibility individuals identified, so healthcare or care homes, where you're using alternative technology, so maybe chlorine dioxide or copper silver to supplement your temperature control and or where you've got temperature control that is not working or where you've got a confirmed outbreak. So in an office block, if you're doing your temperatures monthly and your temperatures are spot on, so cold water is less than 20 and your hot water outlets are greater than 50, that demonstrates you are in control. There is no need to do Legionella testing. It's okay. only when you fall outside of that controlled parameter, when you've lost control, then it's the need to do Legionella testing. Fantastic. Uh, another question here from Debbie. Uh, she says, when you're talking about flushing, she goes, she apologizes for sounding dark. She says, do you literally mean flushing, including toilets? Uh, she works in an office space environment. And does that a requirement as well or simply taps? Yep, the flushing. So for sure, the term flushing does relate to flushing toilets and flushing taps. So turning the taps on, turning showers on, turning bidets on, sluices, sinks, um, maybe even operating dishwashers and washing machines. So the term flush is used to mean any outlet. I know we, we're used to the term flush to flush a toilet, but it would mean flushing any outlet. Perfect. Uh, one uh, from Helen here. She's been frantically taking notes. Uh, she asked if you could please repeat the British standards that you mentioned. Uh, and is there a charge for these British standards? So uh, the British standard BS 8680 relates to water safety plans. BS 8580 relates to um, risk assessments. British standard um, eight, uh, published document 855468 that's a tricky one to remember. That looks at the um, management of water systems, cleaning and disinfection. They are all available from the British Standard shop and they are chargeable documents by British Standards. On the second from last slide, the, the hyperlinks or the address is detailed where you can actually look for them on the British Standard shop. Perfect, thank you. We've got three minutes left, so possibly one more question uh, to do with symptoms. In the symptoms of uh, Legionella are very similar to cold, flu, or potentially COVID. How do you know if you've got a Legionella problem in your office if you think people are just getting similar symptoms to cold and flu? So the everyone is susceptible to Legionnaires' disease, um, and more pe some people are more susceptible than others. The symptoms are cold and flu-like symptoms, and they do progress to pneumonia. So. I did have one client phone me up many years ago and say, Daniel, everyone on XYZ building has um, got coughs, colds and sneezes. So they've all got a touch of Legionnaires. They've gone home. And I said, no, 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 this is a very dangerous thing. A cough, cold and a sneeze could be a cough, cold and a sneeze. Only a GP can diagnose Legionnaires disease, and they do that with a blood test, sputum test, or a urine test. The blood test and the sputum test take several days. The urine test can be done within 24 hours, uh, give you a result within 24 hours, and the urine test is very specific to Legionella pneumophila serogroup 1, which is responsible for 95% plus of all Legionella-related illnesses. So anyone who might be going back to their offices and um, they start to get coughs, colds and sneezes, don't think you've got Legionnaires disease, 
Um, you can't self-diagnose, only a GP can. Perfect, thank you. Uh, there are still a number of questions coming in, but I'm afraid we've ran out of time with only one minute remaining. So um, I'd just like to end the session by thanking uh, Daniel and for all those who joined us for this webinar. Uh, as I said in the beginning with the housekeeping, there will be a recording going us. It will be on IOSH and you can contact Daniel and the Water Hygiene Centre Direct uh, if you need any more information. Um, so thank you once again for attending. And she, uh, sorry, we shall end this webinar here. Uh, a good afternoon to you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers.